When I was 16 years old, my best friend and I made the dumb decision to get matching tattoos from an older man who was doing tattoos illegally out of his home. He was well known in the area within our age group for giving cheap tattoos to minors. He had recently gotten out of prison for giving minors tattoos and not practicing under state guidelines, and needless to say, I don't know what in God's name we were thinking, but hey, when you're a rebellious 16 year old, not really caring and incredibly dumb, and you have the chance to get a tattoo for $20, I guess any and all common sense flies right out the window. So we set up a time with him to go over to get our tats, I don't remember the exact time that we went over, but I remember it was already dark so it must have been in the late evening or something. It was just the three of us alone in his house. I remember feeling very eerie being there. Something about him and the energy of the place felt very off, but being the dumb teen that I was, I chose to ignore those feelings and go through with it anyways. We were there for about 30 minutes, we got our tattoos and then left. Fast forward to a few months later, I see his picture and name on the news. At first I thought he got busted for his illegal tattooing, and little did I know that it was so much worse than that. He had been arrested for one of the most heinous crimes someone could commit. It turns out he bought an old police car, a cop costume, handcuffs, and would go into parts of Portland that prostitutes frequented impersonating a cop to arrest them. He brought them back to his house and chained up the victims in his basement, his correction garage, where they wouldn't be heard. There, he would repeatedly assault them and torture them. I was absolutely sick to my stomach when I found out. I cannot imagine what these women went through and I still don't really want to know all the details. This was all happening around the same time that we were at his house so the chances that one of the victims were there around the same time as we were could have been a possibility. I thank God that nothing happened to us but there's also a part of me that feels guilt. What if someone was screaming for help while we were there and we just couldn't hear them? Why didn't he kidnap us? We would have been the perfect targets. Every time I look at the tattoo, it's a horrible reminder of what could have been, so I'm planning on getting it covered up. Thankfully, all of his victims are alive, and I hope and pray that they are able to recover from this horrible act. He will be in prison for life with no possibility of parole. Always trust your gut. So about two years ago, I, a 16 year old female, at the time I was 14, was home with my mom. It was just the two of us. Now my mom at the time was addicted to drugs and alcohol and was in an essentially drug induced coma. Nothing could really wake her up. I had decided to take a bath while she slept. My bathroom door was locked, as was my mother's bedroom door, as she seemed to think that we didn't know about her addictions and kept it locked so we didn't quote unquote find out and the house was silent. I had only been in the bath about half an hour before I heard my front door open. I assumed it was my eldest sister coming back from work and as no one else would just walk in. But I wanted to be sure so I texted her. Immediately I got a worried text saying that no she wasn't home, why? Was someone there? I froze. I could hear footsteps. Now our house was small, one story and from the front door to the bathroom door was only a small living room. I heard a weird scraping noise coming from the hallway to the bathroom. I heard the scraping stop outside of the bathroom door and then someone grabbed the doorknob and kept turning it very slowly, side to side for about a minute. The entire time I was silent, frozen still and shaking like a leaf. I wanted to call my mom and ask if it was her but... I didn't want whoever it was to hear the sound and to get to my mom. After a while I didn't hear anything. I stayed in the bath for what I think was an hour until I heard the front door open and click shut softly. I still stayed in the bath long after the water had gone cold until I heard my sister come in and yell if I was here and if I was okay and why the door was unlocked. I got out of the bath and heard her gasp before I had come out but when I did, I swear my blood went cold. There was a line spanning the wall of the hallway. There, the paint had been cut like someone had trailed something sharp along the wall. 
Currently, the theory is that the scraping noise I heard was someone trailing a knife along the wall. I've had a few creepy things happen to me in my life, but this one I still think about how things could have went very wrong very fast. I'm a 20-year-old female. This takes place back when I used to live in southern Indiana, like seriously in the sticks. It was a weekend night and my best friend and I were coming home after our graveyard shift at a local waffle joint. She decided to get her dog from her house so we could stay at my place for the night. This is important for later. So we start heading out into the country where I live, and to get to my house, there's a long, narrow dirt road that you have to go down. About a mile or so in, we see a truck's headlights. We get closer, and it's a nice truck, probably like a 2018 at least. I can't say that I know much about cars, leave me alone, but he's parked to where he's sideways, blocking the whole path. Now confused, I get out and ask if he's okay. He looked hopeful when he saw me at first. I'm just waiting for a friend to come get me. <laughs> My truck's stuck. He smiled at me and I noticed his pupils were nearly completely dilated. He looks back to my car and sees that I have someone with me, and he looks at the dog sticking his head out of the window. His smile fades and he says, Pit bulls are mean and nasty. He quickly turns around and gets back in his truck. I go back to my friend and I'm like, Put this thing into reverse and use whatever hood ray skills that you have to get us out of here. So we take my poor 95 caddy that really shouldn't be driving on a dirt road anyway and back all the way down that road and get back to the main road. Relieved, we take a different road home. Then, lo and behold, the same guy is parked on that road standing off to the side smiling, just looking into our headlights. We were completely about to soil ourselves and we gunned it the rest of the way home. I don't know how he got there before us or what his intentions were, but I'm thankful that I wasn't alone being my naive college girl self. So I was on the way home from Arby's with a mint chocolate shake, zoned out for a second and almost didn't notice his car. I tried just letting him through, but he insisted that I go on ahead. I didn't think much of it and just continued on walking. He drove on ahead and parked his car near some apartments. He had on a black polo shirt, so I assumed that he was just dropping something off for a job or something. As I kept walking, he approached me and offered me a $20 bill. I asked why, but couldn't understand what he said in response. I refused since I know what's best for me. However, that didn't deter him. He grabbed my waist and I stepped to the side. He then started pulling me towards his car. I bit his hand so he wouldn't silence me and made sure to scream as loud as possible to try and attract any bystanders if I could. He managed to get me into his car and just before he could close it, I stuck my foot through the door to keep it open. I then got out and made myself go limp since adding dead weight without warning creates sudden resistance and makes it harder for them to grasp you. Due to this quick thinking, I was able to get away unharmed. I quickly booked it and got on the phone with my mom once I was at a safe distance. I made sure to stay on the phone until I got back. After that, I'd taken some time to calm down and waited for the cops to get there to take my statement. The officer ended up praising my quick thinking, telling me that I'd luckily done everything right in this situation. Please guys, take self-defense seriously. I've only ever had a week-long course, and just that alone had managed to save my life. I didn't remember too much from my self-defense course and only used the basic techniques that I'd remembered, which was basically making noise, dropping my weight, and checking behind me. Any other actions I'd taken were a result of logic and quick thinking. Chances are, if I'd have gotten more self-defense training, it likely wouldn't have been as close of a call as it was. Also, never accept money from strangers. While there are good Samaritans out there, there's also people who don't have your best interests in mind. If you do think they have good intentions, make sure to double check by asking why they're offering you money. If you don't get a good legitimate reason, then make sure to refuse. If you refuse and they still persist, then get away immediately.
For the weekend, I wanted to visit my boyfriend. He lives two hours away, and I always go by train. I'm not easily spooked, but I always keep an eye out. A girl gotta do what a girl gotta do, am I right? One hour into the trip, it was around 8pm then, and I see two men getting in the same train compartment as me. I was sitting in a two-seat, the seat next to me was empty, and in front of me there was a seat for four people. So, two pairs of seats facing each other. The men came in being very loud, even though it was a silent compartment, but nobody said anything because they had already seemed very suspicious. From the moment they stepped into the train, probably before they got in, they had their eyes fixated on me. They stepped in through the door and sat in the seat in front of mine, the four seat, and from then on they kept an eye on me, while discussing things with each other in a language I didn't understand. Like every other girl, I get stared at frequently, especially when I wear my hair down. It normally makes me feeling a bit awkward, but I never feel unsafe when this happens. Until yesterday. But they were staring at me in every possible way. Through the chairs, standing up, sitting down, and bending over to get a good look. Through the reflection of the mirror and by getting up and walking past me. They were taking turns and walking over to the other compartment of the train. The other compartment was only separated from mine with a glass door. Every time one of them got up, they both started staring at me. Then one of them went away, and the other one had a clear vision of me, and they kept staring at me. He poked his head through the middle of the seats and offered me chocolate, which I politely refused. And then the other one came back, and five minutes later, the other man left, and they kept taking turns, walking away. And every time one of them got up, the one who remained seated kept an eye on the other, and on me. Each time they were sitting across from each other they discussed things, but I couldn't translate it. They kept looking at me and then started discussing again. When I had 20 minutes of my trip left, a lot of people got out at one stop, and then it was just me, them, and one other male then. The moment the doors were about to close, one of the creepy men started walking through the doors to check if there were people coming and going, and maybe to check if there was security, I don't know. I don't know why he did it, but when he came back, he scanned the train to see how many people were still on there, I think. And from that moment on, they both got in seats facing me. They would not stop staring at this point. As you can imagine, I panicked and was stressed out, so I slowly turned around to look behind the glass doors to see if there were more people there that could maybe help me, and to my luck, there were more people there. So I slowly and very softly put on my jacket. We still had about more than ten minutes left, and I kid you not, not even two minutes later, one of the men starts getting undressed and changing. He took out his purse and jacket and kept looking at me and fixating on me while still discussing with the other man. And this is where I really started to panic. I already let my friends know what was going on and my boyfriend was already at the train stop where I was supposed to get out. Then I contemplated what the smartest thing to do was, because there is an emergency number on the train that you can call or text if you feel unsafe, but I had a gut feeling that this would not help me. So I got my bags, got up and walked through the glass doors to the other compartment. I sat facing them so I could see what they were doing. They both got up and grabbed their bags and started walking towards me. Now mind you, they were sitting closest to the exit so there was absolutely no reason for them to take this route too. I rapidly started to talk to someone on the seats next to mine and asked if he could help me because I was getting followed and watched by these two grown men. He said that he also thought that they were very suspicious and was getting scared for me. He asked me to sit next to him so he could keep me a little safer and distract the men or something. Then he distracted me a little and asked me questions about my life. When the two creeps saw that I got seated next to that man, they were already coming my way and were making their way through the doors of the compartment. They were glass doors so we could see each other very clearly. I had not shown any fear but I was shaking so uncontrollably that they must have seen how scared I truly was. The moment they got through the door, they saw me getting seated next to the other man and the creeps exchanged looks, looked at me and discussed something, and then looked at me again, turned around and went the other way again. They were walking to the exit of the train, where, again, is a glass door, so we could still see each other. The whole time they were standing around the exit, they were looking at me with a very creepy and disturbed look on their faces. I can only describe it as 
you got away, but you won't be so lucky next time. That's how it felt. The man that I was sitting next to also got that feeling and was trying to calm me down. He told me that he wasn't going to let me get off the train by myself and he would wait with me until my boyfriend arrived. But then our stop came and we walked to our side of the exit and then came a realization. In the exit of the train, there were standing two other men with the same kind of looks as the two creeps. They talked the same language and they acted just as weird. These men were probably the men who the two creeps visited every few minutes. The men at the exit saw me, looked at me with a creepy look, but then the man who kept me safe made sure to them that he would walk with me and immediately they seemed to look away. They also covered their faces with their hoods. The doors opened and they nearly sprinted out, just as the other two creeps had hurriedly left. Then the man who escorted me out waited with me until we found my boyfriend and then he went on with his day. We both could not thank him enough for keeping me safe. I thought that I lived in a very safe country in Europe, but I think that as long as you're a young woman on your own, you'll never be 100% safe while traveling and being abroad. I hate thinking about what would have happened if I was not helped by the man in the other compartment. I wish that I could have thanked him with gifts or a nice gesture, but I don't know his name and I'll probably never see him again. And to that man who saved me, I thank you with all my heart. This happened to me when I was 10. I'm female, dark brown hair, and tan, creamy skin, average height, just so you get the full picture. Now, considering my age and build, I would not have fought back particularly well had something happened at the time. At the time, I lived with my mom and younger brother, who must have been about 7 or 8. We all lived in a pretty secure area of town, and what's more, our apartment had a security guard. To get in the lobby, he had to buzz you in unless you had your own key card. The elevator was activated by keycard too, so either you had your own or the security guard would have to key you in. Also, a small screen inside our apartment with a button to call security if you needed. This made us feel safe to some extent, but my mom is a cautious person and is always very aware. We were moving and we sold a lot of stuff, including our TV, a normal sized flat screen thing. We couldn't take everything with us, so this had to go. Eventually, a man, in mid-30s or 40s, got in touch with expressing interest in our TV. He said that he'd drop by our apartment the same day, and he did, but a little later than expected, as it was around 7pm. He does all the usual checks to see if it works properly, and eventually starts asking my mom about where my dad is. He lived abroad at the time, and then asked me questions like, where's my school and how old am I? Being a naturally friendly person, I answer and ended up telling him all about our field trip that I took with my class to a beach. He then asked if he can connect his phone to our TV to project images of the beach. He'd apparently been there before. My mom reluctantly agrees and he does so. In those pictures, there's a pretty young woman. He says he's a photographer and would I like to model for him sometime. And this is the point my mom pulls me close to her, frowning and politely declines. I don't suspect anything and I am in fact excited and keep asking my mother to please let me model. She tells me to be quiet and doesn't sound happy at all. He continues to talk about his photography and said that I would make a good model. All the while I kept getting more eager and nagging my mom to let me do it. I had no idea of his intentions and was completely okay with the idea. I also noticed the woman on the photo was wearing a skimpy bikini thing and since I really wanted to be grown up. You all remember what that felt like. I asked if I could wear one too. He said yes. My mom, I could tell, was completely freaked by this point. I suspected nothing, of course, and with childlike innocence, I asked him if I would get money, and again he said yes and kept encouraging me to pose for him. Looking back now, I feel terrible for my mom, who knew exactly what was going on but couldn't stop me. On top of all that, he told me repeatedly how good a model I was while I giggled through pose after pose, tossing my hair, arms up above my head or hand on my hip. Really, really creepy looking back on it. He's been there for over an hour now. He says he's calling his friend to ask if he can buy the TV. Why would he do that? Who knows? He speaks with him for a bit and then says that he needs to call his wife this time, and again we let him. 
When he hangs up, my mom asks if he wants the TV again. He tries to start a random conversation to distract her, but it's really late and we're getting tired. My mom calmly explains that it's late now and her kids, my brother and I, are tired and need to shower and go to sleep, at which point the guy says, oh that's fine, they can do that, I don't mind, then encourages us to go wash. Even I was creeped out by this point. My mom again told him to come back another day. He got angry, insisting that he stay because he wanted to check this or that feature on the TV. My mom stood her ground, but I could tell that she was scared, alone with this creep and two young children to boot. After a long argument, she turned to me, telling me to go to my room with my brother. Needless to say, I didn't argue. We went into my room and shut the door behind us. I heard the front door open and my mom telling him to leave or she'd call security. He again tried to stay, but she wasn't having any of it and said something along the lines of, yeah, no, get out of my apartment now, or I am calling the cops. He finally left, and my mom put us to bed. She probably didn't sleep at all that night, and we thought that would be the end of it. The next day he came back under the same pretext as before, but by now it was clear that he had absolutely no interest in the TV, just in us. Security, knowing what had happened prior to that day, immediately called my mom to know if it was okay to let him through or not. I asked if it was the photographer guy again. My mom nodding before, motioning for me to be quiet, then told security that they weren't to let him in, thanked them for calling her first, and that was the end of it. Apparently he got aggressive with security when they tried to show him out. I don't know if he tried anything after that, but I'll ask my mom and post an update if I learn anything. There is something innately wrong about a man who comes into a young mother's apartment, tries to recruit her kid for bikini pics or worse, and refuses to leave. It's sinister and creepy and I don't like to think what could have happened. In 2014, I finally decided that it would be my last year working on the high seas. It paid very well, but there's a reason for that. It's extremely hard being in the middle of the ocean for three months at a time on a non-luxurious 50-foot freezer boat. Living on the ocean is a constant reminder humans aren't meant to be there. From the stench of rotting fish bait, mixed with diesel to the constant motion of swells under your feet, combined with the vastness of nothing, I always compared it to being an astronaut. It tends to drive you up the wall eventually, no matter how fortified you are. For context, just being able to sit on a non-moving furniture back at home was an ethereal experience. The last day of the season tends to be the longest, as we have to pick up every long line that was in rotation and detail the deck of the mess left behind. This would take us very late into the night. On this particular night, we ended our day at around 1.30 a.m., we were 17 hours away from land, so our captain decided to take a nap and allow us two hours of rest before we took our wheel shifts, yet not standard practice, as he was an alcoholic. We were so far offshore, our captain put us on a slow autopilot, which essentially would just keep us from not drifting further from land as everyone took power naps. My little ritual every night was to make some tea and smoke cigarettes by myself on the deck, it was the only time I got to myself in such small quarters. This night, however, was both the last night of the season and of my career on the ocean. Although I was relieved, I felt a weird bitter sweetness knowing that I'll never be this far out in the Pacific Ocean again. I climbed to the top of the cabin where I had secretly stashed a joint in the outdoor freezer. It was sort of my little secret treat at the end of the seasons. I sparked it up and stared out into the moonlit ocean. I went into deep thought for quite some time. As I climbed back down, my jacket got snagged on a fishing hook which was from a fishing rod stored behind the ladder, and this is when my 19-year-old brain concluded I should do something out here that I will never be able to get to do again, and that was, well, letting all of the fishing line out on a 200-pound test rod into the near-infinite depth of the ocean just to see what would happen, I guess. I wasn't all that concerned at the time, as I've seen essentially 99% of the fish that lived out here, but I've yet to see certain deep sea oddities such as anglerfish and such. My fascination took a hold of me. 
I proceeded to clamp on the bigger, heavier halibut lure onto the fishing line's carabiner, which wasn't designed for rods, but I felt that it was heavy enough to sink further down. I began to let all the line out at the A-beam port of the vessel. Standing there for what seemed like an eternity, I began to give up on actually letting it all out. At this point, it was a little past 2 a.m. My day's work was starting to become more apparent to me. I started reeling it in quite quickly as I lost interest in this whole idea. I just wanted to sleep at this point. When suddenly, my rod got hooked on an immense dead weight. Extremely dead weight. It wasn't like a fish. I knew what those felt like. I instantly realized that I got snagged onto a kelp patch on my way up. I just wanted to get this done and over with. As I got the kelp patch closer to the boat, I peered over the railing and noticed that the water was absurdly black even for dimly lit night conditions, almost vanta black. I tugged on my rod trying to assess where the kelp was when I saw a tea saucer sized silver light flashing in the water. Honestly went lightheaded not knowing what I was looking at. I started hearing something reminiscent to hot tube jets spewing out of water, except much louder. The louder it got, the blacker the water became. At this point I was just confused until I see an arm roll up to the side of the boat. As the water cleared from the inky blackness, I saw an eight foot long cigar shaped creature. It was a squid. Out of everything I've caught in these waters, this was by far the most unexpected, as squid don't tend to make their way up this far north. I remembered hearing about an instance a few years back when they got stuck in an ocean current which pulled them further up than usual. My mind instantly went to, how can I get this thing on the deck? The bragging rights that I would have amongst the crew on our entire trip back would be a poetic end of my career. I began to look for a gaff hook, one arm on the rod, one arm pushing totes around on the deck frantically looking. I kept a lot of tension on the rod just to ensure that it was still there, but I started to notice my rod was bending very aggressively, nearly pulling the tip of the underside of the boat. The power of this thing felt almost like a hydraulic winch. No gaff hooks in sight, they must have been placed in a storage compartment as we were going to be docked in the next 24 hours. It was standard practice so they wouldn't get stolen in the harbor. I rushed back to the railing, peering over the side. The squid has seemingly vanished out of sight, but the immense tension was still there and I haven't let any line out. Until I noticed the unfortunate situation. The squid has latched itself on the bottom of the boat like a tree trunk. I put both of my feet on the railing, nearly pulling my back to the deck. I felt a huge release, almost like a giant velcro strap being pulled apart. I nearly fell on my butt. I lunged towards the railing again, trying to shorten the line even more to inch this thing from out underneath. But my skinny teenager arms buckled almost instantaneously, as I could see this thing rolling its whole body and arms back to the bottom of the boat. My anchored foot slipped on a coil of loose rope on the ground, nearly throwing me off the deck. My gut hit the railing. Face to the water, its huge head with its large silver saucer eyes peered out for a moment. They were darting around in a controlled frenzy, almost like it was analyzing me. I neutralized myself and put my feet on better grounding. I began to accept. The risk here might be higher than the reward. Accepting my strength and its immense power, I began to contemplate cutting the line. I noticed the three-pronged hook was attached to the base of its tentacle. In an optimistic attempt, I pulled the rod tightly. The tip starts to bounce and flick. The squid began to contort and twist its whole body, pulling its tentacles close to itself, wrapping one tentacle around its hooked arm. Knowing it had compromised its grip on the bottom of the boat, I pulled once again, until suddenly, the rod snapped straight. There is a cleanly cut, amputated squid arm on my hook. This thing performed surgery on itself. The whole length of the squid slowly pulls forward from out under the boat, and I swear, stares at me for a moment, and with one graceful contraction of its arm and a jet stream of ink, it disappears into the depths. I stood there for a moment waiting for my heart rate to hit baseline. I placed the rod on the deck with the squid tentacle still attached and just stared at it. The tentacle slowly coiled itself around the fishing pole. 
I picked up my teacup off the ground, and I walked into the galley. I throw the remainder of yesterday's cold coffee into my cup, head my way to the captain's stateroom, and knocked on the door. No reply, I opened it a crack and said I'm ready for my wheel shift. The captain, in a drunken mutter, asked, Have you rested? And I replied, It's time to head back. A few months ago, my girlfriend and I were on the drive back home from a late night concert at about 1am. We were basically in the middle of nowhere and I decided to pull off at a random rest stop to use the bathroom. I figured at this time the only people at this place would be just truckers and other people in the same situation as me. I got out of my car and walked up to the building and as soon as I stepped inside, there were a few weird things that I noticed. So this place was laid out with two men's rooms and two women's rooms and two vending machines, one in both corners on either sides of the restroom doors. When I walked in, there were two people, both of them standing directly in front of each vending machine, both just staring at the vending machines, not reaching to get money or actually intending on buying something. So I walked past these people and went into the first men's room. I walked inside and I was the only person in this room, using the urinals, which were laid out in a U-shape. A few seconds later, someone else walks in, an older guy, maybe like 50 to 60, working class looking guy, and he walked over and started using the urinal right behind me, a few feet away. Nothing about this was very alarming at first, but being the careful person that I am, I already have my pocket knife open in my hand in my front hoodie pocket. Once I finish up, I go to wash my hands and walking out the door to the first restroom. As I walk out, I realize that I also had to go number two. So to avoid being awkward, I walked into the second men's room, taking note that these weird vending machine people were in the exact same spot. I go into the first stall and try to go about my business, when I hear someone else walk into the restroom and go into the stall right beside me. Keep in mind, there were about six other open stalls away from me. I thought this was really weird, so I looked down and immediately recognized the work boots as the guy from the first bathroom. This guy just walked in and I wasn't even in there for two minutes. I immediately got up and left that bathroom. I started speed walking out of the building and I noticed from outside, looking back inside, that he also had quickly got up and was heading towards the outside doors. I just hopped in my car, waking up my girlfriend and I told her that I would explain in a minute. I put my car into reverse and just whipped out of the spot as I was shifting into drive. I looked up and saw this guy a few feet away, standing next to this old beat down truck, literally staring me down as I started to drive away. I stared directly back at him and saw him make this really creepy mime like surprise look at me. I was really tired and confused but still don't know what this guy was planning at a rest stop in the middle of nowhere at 1am or if the vending machine people had anything to do with it at all, but this is one of the only times I've ever experienced something like this and have felt an actual danger. If anyone has any similar experiences or ideas of what this may have been, I'm all ears. I want to start this by saying that I know people can be friendly and I don't automatically assume that they're creeps. I picked my girl up from school with my two, nearly three-year-old boy. I decided to take a different route home through the park so they could go to the playground. As we were walking, there was a guy, around 55-ish, walking towards us with a tiny Pomeranian dog. My kids were in awe of this little teddy bear. The man smiled but didn't interact and we passed. A minute later, as we were walking, I turned and noticed that he had gone back on himself and was now following us. This obviously got my attention and I felt a bit strange. He picked up pace and walked alongside us and asked if the children wanted to pet his dog. I was polite and encouraged the kids to stroke the dog. Then we moved on and I kept saying, Okay kids, let's go to the swings. And two minutes later, he came toward us at a different route again asking my children to pet his dog. My guard was up here and I got us away as soon as possible. Now ten minutes later, we're in the enclosed playground. 
Now bear in mind, there are signs everywhere around this area to state that it's a no-dog zone. This guy just appears again, walking his cute dog five feet away from us, trying to get the kid's attention. It worked and they were calling for the dog and he tried to linger. I had to politely ask him to move on and he looked to be so angry with me. He went and that was it. My senses were just searing at me and I had to voice this somewhere. Was he weird or just some type of nice guy? Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. I was a recent college grad and dating a guy who had matriculated in my same class. He moved out to the suburbs soon after graduation for a new big boy job. I stayed in the city and lived in an apartment with a roommate, but being young and in love, I would often schlep 30 or so minutes in irritating traffic to hang and inevitably spend the night. Looking back, he rarely came to visit me, which was the sort of vibe that led me to eventually break things off. Anyway, boyfriend lived in a duplex in one of those labyrinth cookie cutter subdivisions and shared it with two other people. These were virtual strangers that he had found through Craigslist. There was one roommate who was so chill that I don't remember him or her at all. This was also ten plus years ago. And then there was the roommate that made me uneasy and whose creepy face I can unfortunately conjure up clear as a bell even now. And we'll call him Rob. Rob looked like an average, slightly leathery, nebulously 40-something surfer. I remember that he would always be in a t-shirt with some skater and extreme sports logo and flip-flops. He had a bit of a belly and talked in a slow, aloof way that seemed to have a smattering of condescension, no matter what the subject was. Definitely a one-upper personality. The thing I can picture most about Rob was his shaggy, dark brown hair and eyebrows so big that they hooded his eyes and gave him a raccoon-like quality. Underneath the eyebrows were distant, empty eyes, droopy like a hound dog. When he would make eye contact, which was almost never, there was something there or maybe something missing rather, and I just didn't like the way that it felt. Now, something to know about me. I was pretty easy to get along with in those days. I still am affable, but I was akin to a polite Labrador back then. I was enthusiastic and full of joy. I'm not sure if that bubbliness got under Rob's skin or what, or if he was just a sadist. I was always nice to him and as considerate as I could be in their house, but regardless, there were two occurrences that left me chilled and thinking, what did I do to this person? The answer being, nothing. Someone had the idea one night to go bowling. We piled into Rob's VW van and took off for the bowling alley. The route there was on windy country roads and it was a dark stretch of highway. Boyfriend and I are sitting in the middle row, so far back but not by a huge stretch. All of a sudden, I felt the van getting faster and faster. If I had to guess, I would say that it was going 65 to 70 miles an hour. I hate reckless speeding and I'm a bit of a baby, but I tried to keep it cool. However, when he jerked the car around a sharp curve, I gasped and heard him laughing, seemingly at me. Hey, would you just slow down? You're kind of freaking me out. I said, loudly over the thumping stereo. My tone was still friendly, but serious and obviously nervous. He turned up the volume on the radio and accelerated the van. My heart was slamming and I was really scared. I got the impression that he was going faster because I was scared. I yelled at my boyfriend, make him slow down because he was the one who lived with this maniac. My boyfriend yelled a few times, half-heartedly, and I could tell that he was embarrassed by the fear. He drove a sports car at mock speeds and loved racing. Finally, after I cried out please a few more times, my head in my lap, he slowed down but not without making eye contact with me in the rearview mirror once I brought my head up. All I could see were his eyes, and I couldn't tell if he was glaring or smiling. Either way, it was very chilling. The other incident was a few weeks or months later. Boyfriend and I were coming back from something or other and went to his place after. We entered through the sliding glass door that leads into the living room and soon discovered Rob was throwing a party. There were about 20 people milling about the connected living room and kitchen, Staring at us in their unfriendly hipster way as we made our way to the boyfriend's bedroom. Suddenly, one of Rob's party guests, who by the way was built like a refrigerator, decides to roid out and throw a heavy wooden chair. 
He threw it in the style someone might launch a shot put with a little whirl and a yar type yell as he whirled it across the room. I really think the guy was just being a drunken idiot and didn't intend for it to happen, but the chair sailed across the room and right into my left upper thigh, hard. I kind of yelped with pain and surprised and crumpled to the carpet, my hands over my thigh. If not for the blaring music, it would have been silent as no one said anything. Even the guy who threw the chair just stood there with an unfixed gaze like he was trying to see what or who we hit, and then I looked at my boyfriend's roommate. He was smiling, and this time I could see his mouth, and he was smiling. It wasn't a maniacal Cheshire cat smile, but a smug, satisfied smirk mixed with utter contempt. I remember that his nostrils even flared as if this was an unexpected rush of dopamine pleasure through his body. He enjoyed both scaring me and seeing me hurt. Finally, after much too long, my milk toast of a boyfriend whimpered, Are you okay? To which I said, No, help me up. Admittedly a little testy. My eyes were watering with humiliation at the situation, the bone-deep radiating pain, everyone just staring at me, and this man I barely knew feasting his eyes on my distress. I got out of that relationship not long after and felt so relieved to never have to go back to that toxic vortex again. Working as a waitress, people often treat you badly. For every 25% tipper, there's 10 old guys who leer and tip 10%. I usually made it through my shifts okay, but one customer interaction truly creeped me out. It was a slow night, and this older couple got seated in my section. The wife seemed spacey, but nothing too weird. When I came back to their table to get drink orders, she was slowly rearranging the sad little fake flowers that we had for decoration. I joked about it, some line about her messing with my arrangement. She looked up at me, wide-eyed. I'm a florist's daughter. She was still moving them around and looking at me after I left with her drink orders. I came back with her drinks and she's done playing florists and I ask what they want to order and while the husband is speaking she interrupts him repeatedly to order a soup. Same tone each time, no indication that she even hears him speaking. I ask her if she wants it served first as an appetizer. She stares at me, repeats the same sentence. The husband cuts in and confirms that they wanted as an appetizer. I leave to put in their orders. Later I stop by and ask how the food is. The wife grabs my sleeve, right at the elbow, and pulls me towards their table. She compliments the food, but at this point I'm feeling really uncomfortable. Her grip is pretty strong too, so I have to repeatedly tug my sleeve to get away. Finally, they're done with their meals and I ask how everything was while clearing their plates. The wife is very pleased and is still staring at me, wide-eyed and blank. Then she says, I never got your name. I usually don't tell customers my name unless they ask, so I tell her. She stares at me, unblinking, and then asks, Do you know what it means? My name is very common, so it's a weird question. I say it's biblical or something. She still stares, and then she says, It means beloved by God. That was my daughter's name. She's grabbing my sleeve again. I know she was beloved by God because he took her back so soon. She's still staring at me in her weird wide-eyed way, then she smiles. The husband is quiet, unbothered, and I kind of stutter and just get out of there. Maybe she was still grieving or on something like a heavy-duty mood stabilizer or something. She had at least one glass of wine, but... I was really convinced that I was going to drop dead after that conversation. It was just so ominous. I didn't feel physically threatened, sure, but it was the creepiest conversation that I've had with a stranger. I joined a Facebook group where people would post ads for butchering equipment. I had this old meat slicer that was no longer in use. As I was getting ready for work one morning, I got a message. It was around 6.20, but that didn't seem to bother this very passionate potential buyer. 
He asked a few questions about the meat slicer and seemed a bit frantic, like his life depended on that machine. He requested a video call a few times to make sure that the machine was working properly, which I rejected as I was getting ready for work. Then he found another ad that I had posted, an old typewriter. Apparently he was interested in that too. Asked me about the price, if it was functional, etc. Just some pretty standard questions. We had texted for around 20 minutes when he asked if he could call me to really seal the deal. I gave him my number, to which he said, I can't call you. We're not in the same network. Can I call you on Facebook Messenger instead? So he did. I picked up and asked if he could hear me. There was no response. I looked at the screen and, well, let's just say that I find it impressive that someone managed to participate in a semi-normal 20-minute conversation about buying butchering equipment and a typewriter at 6.40 a.m. while touching themselves. Last week, a man approached me on my way out of work. I work in a big facility, so it's not strange that I don't know him. He started by complimenting me, but in a way that made me feel really uncomfortable. He was telling me things like how good I smell and I'm so beautiful that he watches me all the time. He said he wishes that he could see me more often and wants to get to know me, to which I replied that I have a boyfriend and I'm not interested. He laughed at me and said that my boyfriend doesn't have to know and that he wants to take me for dinner. He then asked for my number and he followed me right to my car by this point. There was no one else around and I was starting to feel scared as I've got some trauma centered around men and telling them no. I just wanted him to go away so I unfortunately gave him the number. I didn't give a fake because he'd handed me the phone on the screen that you would type a number you're about to call so I was scared that he might test that. I had a panic attack in my car before I went home and hoped that that would be the end of it and I blocked the number. All weekend he didn't text but I did get called by that same number three times. I don't know if it was his as he didn't give it to me. When I walked into work this morning he appeared out of nowhere and started talking to me like we have this secret relationship or something. I don't know how he found out what time I started because I'd never seen him when I come in before. I don't think I can report it to HR because I'm stupid and I haven't been able to actually tell him he's making me uncomfortable. I don't know if this will persist, but I'm scared to leave work right now. Any advice would be incredibly appreciated. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST. And there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night, and I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to schlep your schmeet.